So hello, and welcome to this session enticingly called Dangerous Archives. Uh, we will be exploring what it means to be the custodians of content that is considered challenging and controversial. And I'm very lucky to be joined here today by two experts in this area. Uh, we have Maddie Smith, who is the curator of printed heritage at the British Library, and part of her remit, or empire, if you will, is the private case collection of material uh, considered obscene or pornographic. We're also joined by Dan Jones, who is the collections officer for the Searchlight Archive, which documents the activity of fascist and racist organizations around the world. Welcome to you both. Um, let's start maybe with some context and maybe Maddie with you first. Could you just tell us a little bit about your career path, how you got to your sort of current role at the British Library, uh, and then maybe talk a little bit about what is the private case? Yep. So um, I've been a rare books curator in the library's printed heritage collections team for five years now. Uh, before that, I was a cataloguer at Eton College Library working with their special collections. Um, I have a degree in English Literature from the University of Exeter and completed my MA in Library and Information Studies at University College London. The Private Case is a collection of books that was segregated from the main British Museum Library collection because they were thought to be obscene. While not all of the books were necessarily pornographic, most of them were. And so the collection has a lot of erotic novels and some explicit visual material. The private, con the private case contains, or did contain at points in its history, other forms of offensive material too, including books about drug use, corporal punishment, and some controversial political polemics. The earliest collection, the earliest items in the collection date from the 17th century. Today, the private case contains about 2,500 volumes, but it held up to 4,000 in the past. This is because books have moved in and out of the collection according to the social mores of the time. Access to the private case was restricted. The collection was kept in lockable cases or cupboards in the keeper of printed books office. Books could only be viewed with his special permission. The vast majority of the books in the private case were considered to be offensive primarily because of their sexual content. The private case was established in the 1850s, a period in which Victorian notions of morality resulted in legislation against the publication and distribution of pornographic material. The Obscene Publications Act was passed in 1857. This made the circulation and sale of obscene materials a statutory offence. This meant that police could search premises, obscene material could be seized, and distributors of such material could be prosecuted. Obscenity was defined by its apparent ability to corrupt those whose minds are open to such immoral influences. And it was in this moral climate and in accordance with this legislation that the private case was established. And, um, you know, were, were there any uh, sort of significant donors? I mean, in, you know, what was the sort of the, the, the sort of donations that really got, got, it, got it going? I, I understand that sort of particularly there were some major 19th century uh, donations. Yeah, that's right. So when the private case was first established in the mid 19th century, it initially contained just 27 books. These were transferred from existing collections within the British Museum Library. But by the turn of the century, the private case contained hundreds of books. Henry Spencer Ashby was um, one of the major donors. He was a wealthy Victorian gentleman and businessman and book collector. He left his book collection to the British Museum in 1900 on his death. It contained a world-class collection of material on Cervantes that the British Museum couldn't turn down, but here was the catch. There was a condition that they had to accept Ashby's erotica as well. These went straight into the private case. Ashby's collection featured important works by the Marquis de Sade, who inspired the term sadism, and many works about flagellation, which was a surprisingly popular genre of erotica in the Victorian period. Um, the private case continued to grow in the 20th century too, with many donations from significant collectors of erotica. The Eric Arthur, Wilde, uh, the Eric Arthur Wildman archive arrived in 1956. He was a strong advocate, shall we say, for uh, corporal punishment for children. He established his own business selling instruments of corporal punishment, including canes, straps, you name it, he sold it. Unsurprisingly, Wildman wasn't a particularly popular man. In 1964, he was invited to speak at a boys' school, and as he spoke, a group of boys ambushed him and beat him with his own canes. 
Um, and then sometimes collections of erotica were given to the British Museum Library to avoid a scandal as well. So the Perfumo Affair shocked the nation in the early 1960s. And in the aftermath, two of Stephen Ward's friends deemed it wise to disperse their personal collections of erotica before they caused further uproar and they donated them to the British Museum Library as well. It's interesting you mentioned uh, flagellation there because the, the, the National Library of France, the Bibliothèque Nationale, um, their equivalent private case collection, Longfer, has a sub collection specifically ded dedicated to, to flagellation. Uh, at, You'd be at amazed school. at how uh, popular it was. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I wonder if that is true of, of, of you know, uh, other, other private case collections in other parts. I wouldn't be surprised. Too. <laughs> I, I mean, one of the, I, when, when uh, I viewed the, the, the collection in, in physical form for the first time, I remember one of the, the items you, you showed me is always stuck. Is I think I think it's a it's a personal copy of Tom. I think it's Tom Jones, where where the author had either had added their own illustrations or had them had them commissioned. Oh, yeah. So some of these items, you know, <laughs> they are they are unique. They are you know aristocrats had that you know had, had created their own personal copies Definitely of times. Are there any, any particular ones that stand out for you? That's the one that stood out for me. Um, yes, I, I think there's another one as well, which um, is humorous as well as erotic. So we've, we've also got um, a copy of um, The Life of Tristram Shandy. Um, and that has been enhanced with um, pornographic engraving, shall we say, but they are of a more humorous nature than anything else. So yeah, there is a very wide range. Um, we have um, very luxurious um, items, you know, printed on very expensive paper, privately printed items, but we also have uh, the complete opposite end of the scale. So we'll have very cheap, um, sort of vulgar, like, like song books, Victorian song books, like really cheaply printed things that a lot more people read. Um, so yeah, we've got the whole, the whole breadth. Well, we'll come back to the private case in, in, in a minute, but I want to uh, sort of turn, turn to Dan now. And Dan, could you tell us a little bit about your, um, your, your sort of path to becoming collections officer at Searchlight and then, and then tell people about Searchlight itself? Yeah, um, so I actually started as an undergraduate uh, at the University of Northampton where Searchlight, um, the Searchlight Archive is now located. And when I was an undergraduate, I started doing archival research, archival work uh, with Professor Matthew Feldman um, and working with a group uh, that we had, the, the Radicalism and New Media uh, Unit. They began working with Searchlight, providing kind of academic and expert um, analysis for the magazine. Uh, they came to conferences that... Um, when I was a, a young undergraduate, I kind of helped um, steward on the day. And that kind of relationship continued through my master's at Oxford Brooks. Um, and I don't actually have a background in, in archive or, or library management. My background is as a research historian. Um, in that way, I'm kind of an interloper into, into the archive space. Um, and in 2011, the university gave, um, they gave uh, Jerry Gable, the editor of Searchlight, an honorary doctorate for his work in investigating and analyzing the criminal behavior of the far right. Um, so we had this kind of relationship built up and then after Searchlight and Hope Not Hate split apart, there was an opportunity for when a question arose about where does Searchlight locate its archive? Um, and we were able to kind of come to a come to an arrangement where it would be put on long-term loan at the university. And I was contacted by uh, Dr. Paul Jackson, who'd taken over from, uh, from Matthew Feldman. Um, and he kind of invited me and said, you know, would you like to, we you know you've been doing some work on archives, would you like to come and look after this collection? Um, and, you know, we'll, you can do your PhD at the same time. Um, the thing I don't often say is that my actual initial response was no, as he, <laughs> he'd phoned me up very early in the morning and I'd moved to Wales. Um, 
So <laughs> I said, no. Uh, I then phoned him back about an hour later and said, that was very stupid. I, I'd actually like to do this. It sounds great. Um, so for, for six months, I was commuting from, from Cardiff in Wales to Northampton um, to do the job. Um, so that, that's kind of how, how I came to it and how it came to Northampton. Um, the archive itself is based on the investigative collections of Searchlight Arch of the Searchlight magazine. Searchlight magazine is it's, it's one of the foremost anti-fascist magazines in the world. It's spawned numerous um, kind of other magazines. Um, it's worked with groups in, in Germany like Antifascistische Infoblatt, and I apologize for any of my pronunciations. Um, groups like Reflex in France, um, Expo in Sweden. So it's kind of a, it, it's got an international presence. Um, its origins are in Jewish defense groups of the post-war period, uh, particularly 62 group um, in its immediate case, and, and before that 43 group. Um, and it's one of, I'm always very careful about saying it, I think I've looked around. It's one of the largest collections of far right and anti fascist material, certainly of the post war period, in university collections. Um, some of it is incredibly extreme material. It's come from groups like Combat 18, it's come from the National Socialist Group, uh, from Column 88. These are all kind of very small, but very, very violent, very focused on, on, on that kind of side of things. Um, and yeah, that's 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 what we are. We're about a thousand archive boxes, uh, of which four hundred are on catalogue. We're still a still a very young archive uh, in the grand scheme of things. We we suddenly can't claim anything to the the nineteenth century or anything like that. I, I, it's probably a fairly obvious question as to why sort of material at Searchlight it, it comes under the category of of, of 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 dangerous and objectionable. But just to give people a sense. You know, we're not just talk, we're not just talking about the sort of the minutes of committee meetings here. You know, some of this material is quite quite graphic. I mean, could you, without sort of going into depth, can you perhaps just give people a sense of why this material is 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 dangerous? I mean, firstly, just as an aside, as a historian, I'd love if there were more minutes of meetings. Um, <laughs> yes. It would be really helpful. Actually, they, they didn't keep that because that wasn't as in. You know, it's the investigative collections really what they're interested in was what the far right were up to far more than what they were um in terms of, of why some of i mean obviously a lot of it is, is very racist even, you know at a time when the world even was more accepting of of racist language this was even beyond that um several of the magazines saw their publishers go to jail for breaches of um the various race relations acts um, I mean, for example, there's, there's Bulldog, which is aimed at young people, was published by Joe Pierce, and I believe he went to jail three times over the course of publishing uh, that at the end of the 70s and the early 80s. Um, so it's, it can be really problematic and really challenging. Um, and at the most extreme side, as I say, some of this material has come from, from terrorist organisations, and it does force us to be very, very careful because there isn't actually any clear protection in law um, for archives and, and researches in that way. We have to go for kind of public, um, public good defences. So we always have to be very vigilant in, in what we do with it. Well, that's, I mean, that actually, that's a really interesting point to draw to, together there. You know, so how do you both sort of manage access to your to, to the to collections um i mean maddie you know for many years the private case was you know it was difficult for people to, to access so can you maybe talk a little bit about that and then how people might access the physical collection today yeah um so it was sort of in the 1960s 1970s onwards that um works gradually began to be moved out of the private case um so it started with um works that were sort of like a, like scientific sexual material, like biological sort of studies, that sort of thing, rather than erotica and pornography. Um, all of that was in the private case prior to the 1960s. And so that 
slowly started to move out. And then in the 1970s, the catalogue started, people started to put private case books onto the general catalogue, meaning that um, it was no longer in a separate restricted list that nobody could see and nobody could access. And that was really the start of sort of desegregating the books from the private case. Um, and then since then, the private case is now fully catalogued on our um, online explore catalogue and is available for readers to consult in our rare books and music reading room on site in St Pancras. Um, and there are no longer any general restrictions on access. The occasional thing might be restricted because it needs conservation, but that's the same for all of our collections. And so there aren't any, any more sort of special requirements um, needed to access the private case, which is good. So, it took a long so time. So that's a really, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, quite a, it's, it's quite an interesting contrast, as you say, that, you know, nowadays, yeah. the you know, material like the private case, you know, the, the, the restrictions are not there. Whereas Dan, I imagine with, with Searchlight, in fact, I know this, you know, you do, you do vet the people who come and consult the collection. Uh, so tell us a little bit about what your, your uh, policies are around access to the fiscal materials. Yeah, it's kind of a, it's a place of conflict between generally a very, you know, we want to make this available around the fact that we, we do have a responsibility to, to look after it and also ensure it's not missing used because obviously much of this material was used to radicalize people to push them towards actions that are very damaging and so obviously if it's if it's simply released out there it can return to that kind of original purpose mm. um, what we have in place is a very simple form um, it's alongside registration with the archive which is you know the, the very normal thing everyone goes through every archive uh, but before coming before booking um to come there is a a form it just asks primarily who they are and what what they're wanting to use the archive for the purpose of visit there needs to be a you can't just browse for curiosity in that in, in that way um there has to be you know, it has to be something you want to find out for academics which is by far the bulk of our users that's very easy they have institutional links and records they're managed by ethics committees um, by professional ethics for students um, or anyone under supervision again we can ask their supervisor to provide um, just a short email or a letter just confirming that their institutional affiliation and, and the fact that they're, they're under supervision by a proper person. Um, for journalists, again, they it, it's quite easy. The difficulty comes when it's people like kind of independent researchers or those around, but in general, it just becomes a conversation, just a short conversation with them. Um, we haven't refused access to anyone yet, although in one or two cases, we have just put in small restrictions. So we might say, okay, but you can only take pencil notes. You can't take images. We're not going to photocopy things for you. Um, that kind of thing. And, and there are some boxes um, that we don't allow access to either, because again, it's that extreme material that we're not we're not sure we should reveal, or more mundanely, data protection, um, because obviously, being post-war and modern, we've got details of. Uh, people who may not be in the public sphere and then that's a whole a whole ethical conundrum so actually so ethics was going to be sort of my next uh, area to, to move into so you know it's it's interesting you know my, I was going to ask you what it means to be a res, sort of responsible guardian of this material and you've both in some ways sort of touched on it I mean I think Dan you're very much uh, sort of focused on sort of the ethics of the right people accessing this material. And Maddie, you mentioned conservation. I suppose in your sense, being a responsible guardian is about, you know, actually the, the materials themselves. So maybe Maddie took a little bit more, more about that. Yeah. So for me, it's about getting the balance right between facilitating access to the material and then protecting the collection. And this balance is arguably something that staff in the past didn't always get quite right, opting to restrict access to the collection both to conform with um, like the legislation of the day, but also to protect it from theft and mutilation, as Dan said, that is a very real danger for some of this material. 
Um, there was also a bit of a value judgment on the sorts of people who would want to see this type of low ground material in the past. So only sort of proper researchers were ever granted access. And for me, these attitudes don't really apply um, in this day and age. And the private case is now fully accessible. However, we do have to be aware that material like this is particularly vulnerable to theft and damage. And as a result of that, some of the books in the collection are in a higher reading category. Um, this means that um, supervision from the rare books reference team is required when looking at that particular item or that particular volume. And um, as Dan says, sometimes we um, prevent photography of particular items. Yeah. yeah. Dan, I mean, you, you touched on sort of the sort of tension between uh, you know, free speech, which itself is a term often co-opted by the by the by the far right, uh, and the and the fact that there's the the legal protections around this this are quite quite grey. I just wonder if you could talk more about more about those issues. So I know you you wrestle with them constantly. Yeah, I mean the yeah, the far right do do like those kind of rights based campaigns. They're actually a a very dangerous crossing point. They allow them to to mix. So it's a whole interesting other side of it. Um, yeah, there is a kind of a balance that has to be struck, I think, with, with, with free speech and, and some of this material because it is so far to the extreme. Um, but also there is, I was kind of, when I was pondering this, I, I think back to things like there's, um, there's a submission in the archive, which is to the McPherson inquiry around Stephen Lawrence's uh, murder, um, the anniversary of which was just the other day. Um, and Searchlight laid out the history of BMP and other far-right publications down to the wards in the areas around where Stephen Lawrence uh, was killed. Um, and that always kind of underlines that, that, that balance that has to be struck, the, kind of the, the importance of free speech balanced against some of the harm that extreme speech can do because it licenses people to move beyond societal norms, to take violent action, to hurt, to harm, to end potentially uh, someone else's life. So that's probably one of the, the big things. But we, for our sake, we try to be as open as possible because researchers need to be able to access even that material um, to be able to understand and potentially start to counter and denature some of, of, of that in the wild. Uh, one of the things we're very careful of is where that material is being made available, um, for example, in a presentation. Um, we always try to make sure that the commentary that we've put around it cannot be separated out from the material itself. So someone can't simply pull out the racist material, use that for its own end. Um, yeah. Because some, some of it is 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 very horrific and and just we don't we don't it would it would be deeply upsetting if we ever contributed um, to, to the harm that people have felt. So I mean, Maddie, perhaps th thus far we've sort of set up a kind of a difference whereby you know nowadays the, the private case it's you know it's you know more or less socially acceptable, whereas the material that Dan's dealing with much of it is still extreme, but. You know, is there content within the private case that is you, know, you you might consider or the British Library considers sort of still unacceptable for for wider access? Yeah. So when we were preparing the private case for digitisation, uh, we took the opportunity to conduct an in-depth review of the collection, and we were advised by our legal team that a couple of items were potentially illegal under current legislation. These were removed from the collection and not digitised and um, their status will have to be reviewed periodically in the years to come. So it is quite a tricky area. Um, in terms of um, sort of free speech and how it relates to um, the private cases, it's a sort of different way of looking at it for us, I think, because um, it's a really important aspect of the private case. And um, I think it relates more to sort of censorship and the struggle for free speech as opposed to free speech as a potentially dangerous um, thing. I mean, people were writing and producing and reading these books in, in the collection at times when it was illegal to do so. The Obscene Publications Act of 1857 held sway for decades. 
Um, a new act came into law in 1959, and this did change certain things. It was still an offence to publish this sort of material, and police could still seize such material under warrant but the act defended publishing obscene material for innocent dissemination and for the public good. And this was um, the legislation that was used in the acquittal of Penguin Books for publishing D.H. Lawrence's Lady Chatterley's Lover, which is quite a landmark moment. Um, and then in this 1960s, more liberalized climate, the British Museum sort of desegregated the private case books. Um, they were entered into the general catalog where everybody could see them. Um, so in this sense, the private case represents the power of free speech, really, and the struggles against like moral censorship that have existed for, you know, a hundred of years. So you mentioned digitisation, and so for, full disclosure for those who aren't aware, so Gail has worked with, with uh, both, both institutions, Searchlight and the British Library, to digitise, in the case of the private case, we've digitised all of the private case that was legally permitted for, for, for digitization. And in the case of Searchlight, we, we agreed a, a particular subset uh, of, of the collection working closely with, with, with Dan and his, his colleagues. Um, and that's part of our, our political extremism and radicalism series. Um, so, you know, we've, we've worked with, with, with both organizations to digitize the content. Um, you know, I'm very aware that it's not a case of an organization like Gale comes and says, let's digitize and you know, organizations say, yes, please. There's a whole series of discussions on, on your, your side about whether to, to work both to digitize itself and to work for companies such as Gale. So I wonder if you're able to talk a little bit about the sorts of considerations that happened at your end. And maybe Dan, let's, let's start with you. I mean, you know, digitization throws up all sorts of uh, questions for, for a collection such as Searchlight. Yeah, um, it, it threw up quite a few. I mean, obviously there was the concern over over framing and and how the material would be uh, presented. Uh, to be honest, one of the big concerns um, we are a small higher education institution archive within an academic uh, faculty. Um, we do have to prove our worth to the broader university we have to show that we're being used. There was a fear that having this material available would, would drop footfall. It would make us seem less important, less used. Even though people were using our material elsewhere, we, there wouldn't be a way for us to necessarily um, record that. Um, I should say that we very quickly realized actually it, it wouldn't devalue the collection. It wouldn't um, do all that, but it's something we had to, to consider. Um, we did spend a lot of time working uh, with yourself, Seth, but also with, with your colleagues trying to talk about what's appropriate, um, what material could go, what material um, couldn't. Um, but ultimately, it kind of came into discussions around the ethos of the archive. And it's always been about promoting learning, balancing that with responsibility. And for us, Gail seemed to understand the collection and some of the risks, um, I mean, your, your colleague Rachel, you know, came in, she was able to discuss the problem, the kind of concerns that we had, the material that we had, um, the fact that we are a mostly modern archive, there's copyright, there is data protection, mm. all of all these kind of difficult issues. Um, and ultimately the big fear we had was kind of how the material would be handled. It, it, it's on loan to us, it's not our material. Some of it is very delicate, um, especially 1920s Soviet material. They'd had very bad staples. It is the bane of my existence. Um, but also, you know, some of the material, I don't know if it exists anywhere else. It's pamphlets that were designed to be handed out and thrown away from a march in um, you know, the 1960s, or we've got 1940s anti-fascist membership material or scrapbooks that are one of a kind with bare ones in. Um, and so in that, we had to have a conversation, not just with ourselves, but but with Gail about about how it be handled. And to be honest, they brought, it was always about our comfort. So for us, it kind of settled a lot of those concerns and, and you know, experts were brought in it it's been actually a real, real help for us because we've now got the digitals as protection against some of these more delicate items you know we don't have to necessarily handle them as much if we've got a, a good facsimile 
um, in our collection. Uh, it's funny you mentioned staples. I never realized when I first started out in this career how much rusty staples would feature as an ongoing, ongoing problem. And I, I implore anyone uh, storing things now for the future, please, please, please do not staple things together because it will uh, my my future my future counterpart in eighty years time will not be will not be pleased. Um, you mentioned actually about what would be the impact of digitization on footfall to the fiscal archive. Have you have you seen a a sort of a, a, a difference one way one way or the other? Um, yeah, I mean, not to prove ourselves completely wrong when we had these fears, but um, we were completely wrong, um, which I don't like to admit. So immediately after, on the first year after the radicalism, um, the extremism um, product was released, um, and this, my understanding is primarily America and Canada tend to be the very early adopters um, of, of, of this material. And it's actually interesting. We saw a big increase in people coming over from Canada and America. Um, I'm not sure Northampton in the middle of England is, is normally a huge tourist destination uh, for people from, it, it's a lovely, we've got a very nice uh, guild hall. Um, but actually I think from, from discussions with users, what's happening is people were able to access the parts of the material that are in the digital collection, and they're able to then see what was in the wider collection, and kind of they're able to then put together much better proposals to get research funds to come across because they could they could demonstrate there would be value there, but also it helped them realize the wealth of material that is kind of in the collection. We again small archive i'm the only staff member uh, working on it we've got a large number of boxes many of which aren't yet on catalog so one of the best advertising things for what we have is the magazine itself which is part of the collection so people reading through and getting to that is it has actually boosted our footfall I'm delighted delighted to hear that maddie how does that chime with the experiences the british library had with with digitizing the private case um well, there are lots of things that we had to consider as well before digitizing uh, the private case. The first was the physical conditions, um, condition of the items themselves. So are they in a good enough state to withstand the handling needed to photograph them? Uh, can we afford any conservation requirements that might be thrown up? We also think about the rarity of the individual books. Um, we think about are they digitized elsewhere? Are they unique copies? For the majority of the private case books, the secretive circumstances around their publication means that many of them are incredibly rare and some, sometimes they're unique. Therefore, it is our responsibility to digitize them really and allow people in other institutions to see them. And then lastly, but definitely not least, we think about how significant the collection is as a whole. Um, in this case, the answer is that the collection is extremely significant. You know, It's arguably the best collection in the world of this sort of material. And so all in all, the decision to digitise was sort of like a no-brainer at the end of the day. Um, in terms of the benefits of having uh, this sort of content available digitally, for us, the most important one is access. Uh, now the private case can be accessed by researchers across the world in a way that was just obviously never possible before now. And it also demythologizes the collection to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. So the private case is still occasionally referred to as a secret collection of forbidden books that nobody can see. And uh, so by digitizing it, we are saying very clearly that this is no longer the case. Yeah, yeah, I, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a classic magnet for sort of the people who yeah. believe in the Illuminati, et cetera. Yeah. It certainly yeah. is, yeah. Yeah. Um, you've both mentioned of, uh, in a during the of course, this conversation, researchers. So maybe let's let's talk a little bit about you know who actually uh, sort of consults these materials. Um, you know, Maddie, actually, just, just yesterday, um, I came across a blog post from the University of Victoria in Canada, actually talking specifically about their use of the digital private case and the importance of you know even getting students to to study historical erotica. I'm just wondering if you know of um, of, of other other projects or other researchers who've sort of made excellent use of the private case. I don't know any, any individuals as such, um, but I do think that it gives us a really fantastic insight into contemporary attitudes towards sexuality and how this is, these have changed over the centuries. Um, 
providing excellent material for people studying gender and sexuality at various levels. Um, it also provides a really unique opportunity to study censorship and the differing views of yes. obscenity across different societies and at different times. Um, so in this way, I think it's a treasure trove for particular researchers. It's also good from a bibliographic perspective, which might be slightly more niche, but um, the study of like the forbidden book trade and the Victorian sort of circulation of this sort of material um, is popular. And this sort of material is, this sort of collection is really good for that, for that study. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, you've mentioned you, uh, you, you think it's, it's one of the best, if not the, the best uh, collections of its type in the world. There, there are other private case collections. We've mentioned L'Enfer at the Bibliothèque Nationale. I think it's the uh, Delta collection at the Library of Congress. And the, there was, yeah. I mean, how, how does the sort of the BL private case collection relate to slash compare, compare with those? Uh... Well, first of all, ours, ours is slightly bigger than some of these other collections. The other collections are smaller, but still obviously really significant. Um, the one that you didn't mention is also the fire collection at the Bodleian Library. Yes. Um, yeah. So that collection is similar in some respects, but it contains a much more general array of subversive material. Um, so it, it wasn't necessarily as much like pornographic content as maybe we have or... Um, the On Fair collection has at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. Um, in terms of the Bodleian, the, um, their fire collection is fully catalogued. I'm, I presume it's the same at the BNF as well. Um, and the Bodleian even displayed their previously restricted books in a public exhibition a couple of years ago. And so attitudes are really changing. Um, I do think it's interesting though that the British Museum Library was not the only, it was not the only institution to treat these books in that in this way. Um, it just sometimes feels as though um, myths and conspiracy theories have sprung up around that particular collection, but actually um, it was maybe symptomatic of how society was at that time that, you know, these key institutions in various places all did the same thing. So yeah, there were definitely definite similarities across institutional collections there. Dan, thinking about um, far right studies, you know, I, I can. There are other sort of major centres for the uh, far right as well as search. Like I'm thinking, but Berkeley partic particularly uh, has a as a centre for far right studies. Yeah. What are the connections between Searchlight and those other research research centres? Um. <laughs> it's academia, so maybe there are no connections. Sometimes it's you know well, things they, operating. Yeah. Given you know, we are relatively relatively I think it's less than eight years since we opened and we opened actually within months of receiving the material there was a a mass cataloging job by it by me and then we were able to open we don't have um a lot of formal links there's lots of the unofficial informal cooperation um we've tried we're slowly now trying to build up some of these links um we do work for example with groups like uh car uh, the center for analysis of the radical right um we've we've kind of worked with um with various other groups we you know we're loaning out material now that we're doing our our first part of a of an exhibit that's going to be uh hopefully at the vena library um although uh covid has somewhat disrupted those plans um so we're, we're slowly trying to build them up, but we don't actually have all those ones. If, if people want to come and approach us about them, we're, we're always happy. But mm. uh, it, it, we've been primarily focused on kind of serving um, academic researchers, journalists that have come through um, these kind of people. I mean, we, we've had journalists, uh, we've had academics rather from, uh, you know, from both local people like Paul Jackson here at the university studying um, Colin Jordan and these kind of very small group of schools. We've even had Australian uh, academics that we've, we've worked with, uh, people like Evan Smith looking at student protests and um, kind of everyone in between. So, yeah, that, that's kind of been our link so far has been with individual academics or with journalists doing Stieg Larsson research and things like this. Mm -hmm. Because um, I, 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 am I right in thinking Stieg Larsson actually contributed to Searchlight? He obviously was he was working for a Swedish Swedish equivalent magazine, but 
Yeah, Expo kind of was founded in the in the searchlight mold, in it, if you like. Stieg was uh, the Swedish correspondent for Searchlight for a number right. of years. Um, and more famously, of course, the author of The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo and the Millennium uh, Trilogy. Yeah. Um, and so ad, ad, anti-fascism is a, is a good segue here because um, Searchlight and the, the, the digital archive include oral histories by anti, anti-fascists, uh, you know, many of whom were very bravely infiltrated far-right far right movements. So just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about how the oral history projects came about. I think Paul Jackson and Jerry Gable, the editor of Searchlight, were heavily involved in that. Yeah, I mean, it started... Oh, this is taking me back. It started, it started quite a number of years ago. Um, and our, our dean at the time, a um, guy called Doug Ray, uh, kind of supported the idea of using some of the funds that we'd brought in through uh, some of our work on consultancy to enable us to start to record these histories. Um, we had a couple of postdoctoral researchers a guy called Dr. Benjamin Lee and Dr. Gavin Bailey, and they kind of basically we, we paid them to to go and collect these stories. Uh, a researcher, Siobhan Highlands, added some more in recent times. Um, but Jerry Gable at Searchlight kind of gave us the introduction to a lot of these people, and that often anti fascism, there is a concern, there is always, you know, it's a very, it can be a very insular groups at times, there is always a a fear, you know, in some ways they've, they've been involved in effectively combat against very existential threats. So having that introduction there meant that we were able to get into places, get interviews with some really fascinating uh, people. And, you know, it, it was a really important project that we wanted to do because we we realised time was marching on. Um, sadly, mm-hmm. the the history of, oral, or history of oral history is often that the mind only turns to it too late. Um, you know, things like the Holocaust uh, testimonies only really starting to pick up in the 90s when we're sadly losing many survivors. And in the case of anti-fascism, even those we captured, we've lost several of our contributors, very sadly. And the last veterans of Cable Street um, kind of passing along. And and that's a lot of that's a lot of information because of how transient these movements are often they the, the material the information is is verbal um they didn't necessarily take minutes they didn't necessarily note things down if they did it it went and scattered to the winds and so you know, that was an important thing for us to do and, and now it's a i think a hundred hours roughly of of material and as you say it covers includes people who went into the far right um and includes also some kind of those hidden it's a terrible trope and i know we hate it but these hidden histories so talking about uh for example sonia gable um and she talks about her time at uh, dixmuda uh, a camp um for the far right in, in the low countries and the suspicions that she's, she, she was a mole and then rifling through her material and at later camps, men walking around with shotguns. And you realise this kind of threat and this role that actually female activists played within anti-fascism, not just on the streets, not just fighting, but actually deep infiltration into these movements. Um, it, it can be really interesting. Yeah, and I, and I think it's it, it's an example of where oral history really comes into its own. We're actually hearing hearing the voices and the the you know the, the narration in the in the author's own words is incomparable. Um, so yeah. you know I'm you know very very pleased that Search Searchlight carried out that project and we're able to make those interviews more accessible. Um, closing closing out. You know, Maddie, I mentioned that the in, in your introduction that you know the private case is just one one part of what you look after at the BL. I mean, a uh, curator of printed heritage at the British Library is, is, is a is a vast vast remit. Um, can you just share some other interesting uh, collections you've worked on recently? Sort of other 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 passion projects you have? Yeah, so me and my colleagues we're really lucky because the collections, as you say, are so rich and so diverse. And this means that our research can lead us down all sorts of interesting paths. 
Um, I've recently written a blog post on the small number of broadside ballads about highway women as opposed to highway men in the collection. Um, and I'm also one of the curators working on an upcoming exhibition about the history of news publication in the UK. So the, that's a major thing that I'm working on at the moment. The space. And uh, <laughs> yeah. Dan, Dan, or should I say Dr. Jones, uh, because uh, Dan was very recently uh, awarded he, his PhD. Um, uh, so congratulations, congratulations on that. So what, what are your immediate postdoctoral plans? Uh, you know, will you be staying affiliated with Searchlight and the University of Northampton? Uh, have you, are you doing a, a lecture tour uh, in, in, the, in the coming months? Um, where, 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 where does your research take you now? Um, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll be staying at the, staying at the, the archive at, at the University of Northampton. Um, I'm currently working on a... Uh, a chapter which so I'm now looking at the contemporary American far right and their use of environmental imagery, um, but also religion's role within anti fascism in the post war period. Um, and we are now launching a, a research group at the university, slowly trying to, to build up on kind of the work that we've been, we've been putting in. Um, hopefully, uh, hopefully there'll, there'll also be a book out of the PhD at some point in, I'm hoping not too immediate future. <laughs> I'd like a little <laughs> break from it now. Wonderful. Well, best, best of luck with that. Um, well, that, that leaves me to say thank you to both Maddie and Dan, and thank you to you all for, for watching. We look forward to hearing your questions. Thanks. <laughs>